Today on the Perception and Action Podcast. What is the difference between an action capacity and a skill? How can we better connect the two through affordance theory? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25 year journey as a researcher, professor, and high performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception and Action Podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about a couple extra things that might interest you if you're enjoying the podcast. First, my book, How We Learn to Move, A Revolution in the Way We Coach and Practice Sports Skills, is now available in audiobook format. You can find it on Audible or Amazon. Second, if you're interested in working directly with me, I currently have openings in my monthly mentorship program. This includes monthly Zoom meetings, either one-on-one or with your staff, analysis of your practice designs, and a monthly group discussion with coaches and instructors from a range of different sports. To find out more, please go to patreon.com forward slash perception action. Now on to the show. Hi everyone, this is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast. In this presentation, what I want to cover is the difference between an action capacity and a skill and how we can link them in training so that they support and complement each other. So my overall goal here is to, for for example, is to make the weight room and the practice field work together in a complementary manner so that we get more skillful athletes. And the way that I want to do this is through the use of affordance theory, right? What does developing action capacity do for skill, right? The way to root to understanding that for me is linking the idea of affordances. And of course, what I'm going to talk about mostly today is baseball, the sport of baseball. So also along the way, I want to answer some burning questions that I get a lot from people. First off, you know, if we talk about baseball training and the ideas of Franz Bosch and Randy Sullivan and different people, Right, we that one of the ideas they they promote and I support is the idea that we can develop certain attractors. Right, there's certain attractors that you need, um, like a hip hinge and uh, planting from above, that were, are kind of universal attractors for skilled movements. Well, for a lot of people, that sounds a lot like prescription. Right, I'm telling you the ideal way to move. Right, so I want to touch on why those two things are different. Right, developing attractors versus prescribing particular movements. I want to touch on that question. So why isn't training to develop tractors the same as prescriptive instruction for an ideal movement solution? The second question I want to ask is, why do, in, in again, in the kind of Franz Bosch training, and, and you, you'll see in my new book I have coming out on the constraints that approach to baseball coaching, we encourage some isolated decoupling exercises. For example, using an aqua ball. So there are some cases where I, I support using decoupled. But at the same time, I, I rail on things like hitting off a tee or dribbling around cones that are decoupled. So why do, are some of these decoupled exercises okay and others aren't, right, in my view, in, in the ecological approach view? So that's another thing I want to get to. Okay, so let's dive into this and by t- diving into the uh, topic of affordances, right? So an affordance, I've covered many times before, an affordance is Gibson's idea, is uh, an opportunity for the action um, uh, the offered by the environment, right? So our environment provides or oper- offers us uh, opportunities to act. And the example I'm using here is uh, th- there's a there's an image of me from the last one, the last conferences I did, um, standing, I'm presenting, and behind me is a row of chairs, right? Kind of bar stools behind me against the wall. And that, in Gibson's terms, is inviting me uh, the possibility of laying down on them, right? I could lay down across those chairs and have a nap if I want. They're all together, the perfect nice height, okay? But, right, one way to think of affordances are invitations for action from the world around us, right? So around us, the world is inviting us to do different things, sit, stand, lay down, throw, catch, so on. But we don't have to necessarily accept these invitations, even though they're there, right? So when I'm giving an invitation, I'm not likely to accept the, the affordance of laying across a bunch of chairs. If I'm waiting in an airport, 
and I have a delay in my flight, yes, maybe I would accept that exact same invitation, that exact same affordances. So affordances are invitations from our environment, okay? One of the key things for practice design <coughs> and design in general, right, is that often the affordances that um, um, are from our environment conflict with the affordances we try to, to make our athletes take, right, in terms of our design. Right, a classic example of this is, so invitations from our environment get accepted um, um, even when we try to avoid them, we try to design around them. And a classic example of this is often you'll see a parking lot, right? You, you're, there'll be a path to a parking lot. Uh, they have a, they'll built a sidewalk that they want you to follow all the way around to get to your car. But between the, that, you and the parking lot is a field or a grass or landscaping that you will walk, you can walk across and get to your car and quit more quickly. And invariably, when you see this, you'll see a big, ugly dirt path cutting through the landscape or grass because people are taking the affordances, right? They're taking the affordance offered by the environment, the quicker path to their car across the grass, even though we're trying to force them to take another affordance going around the sidewalk, right? So it, it, Tim, invitations get accepted no matter often that conflict with our basic design. And this is true of practice design as well. Another classic example. Um, is that, um, you know, we, the, the classic example of a door, right? Often we have doors where there's a handle that you could use to pull and we have a sign that says push, right? What, well, you know, so what we're doing is we're offering affordance from the environment. We have a handle on things are for pulling, right? Um, if you want to but it's push, you can just press against a flat surface. The push sign in this case is an implicit, explicit instruction, Right. So often in, in our coaching environment, we have all these affordances, invitations going on by the way we design our practices, and then we throw explicit instruction on top of it, okay? We put push signs all over the place. And one thing we should try to do as coaches is let the practice design the environment do the, as much of the talking for us as possible, right? Design the practices so that the invitations occur naturally, you don't need to put signs, right, all over the place to push, right? And this goes to something, if you're interested in this kind of idea, I recommend the book, um, The Design of Everyday Things by Donald Norman. And he, he points out, this is not talking about sports, it's always talking about design of products. Um, he, he, his quote is, anytime you see signs or labels added to a device, it's an indication of bad design. A simple lock should not require instructions. Right. I would extend that to coaching by anytime you see a coach giving lots of explicit verbal instructions to an athlete, it's an indication of poor practice design. The environment should offer invitations to afford the actions you're trying to encourage. You shouldn't have to be telling your athletes, go through that gap, pass to that player. If you design practice well, amplifying information, using constraints, then those invitations will be just there, right, in the environment. That's a key, a key, key point. Okay. So in baseball, you know, we could have uh, affordances that we want to paint the corner with a fastball. So we want to throw on the outside plate. Or if the if the batter's standing far away from the plate. If the batter's standing close to the plate, we could try to throw it inside and jam them, right? So for baseball, we have tons of these invitations, okay? So affordances are inv inv invitations from our environment, right? We get them all the time in all the sports we play in all the environments. Second key point. Affordances are conveyed by information, okay? In information, right, what we're talking about here is not kind of a, the typical idea of information. Information we get is due to the fact that the sensory information, the information we perceive and pick up and receive, is structured by the environment of the, uh, our environment around us, by its physical properties. So in my giving a presentation with chairs behind me example, right? Light is reflecting off the chairs to my eye, right? How it reflects, what exact pattern I get on my eye depends on the depth of the chairs, their height above the ground, their width, right? So really narrow chairs or ones that were separated far apart or something like that are going to give a different structure. So this is Gibson's idea of specification, right? The structure of sensory information we receive is particular to a specific event or object in our world, right? So it conveys a specific affordance, right? So here's another example, a picture of me at the same conference standing outside during the demonstration day. 
And uh, there's a, um, instead of a, a row of seats, now we have a canopy, right? A canopy, um, a little tent on the ground. Um, it's a, so it's a different physical environment. It's not chairs anymore. It's tent, right? It has different height, different width, different depth, different angle. So it's going to structure the light differently. The right light's going to reach my aim, aim, eyes in a different way. So it's going to specify a different affordance, right? It's going to tell me that I can get shade underneath it. It's not telling me I can lie down on top of it because the light is different. Okay, so a different physical environment equals different structuring of sensory information equals different affordances. Okay, um, you know we get this the same. Okay, we, it doesn't have to necessarily be visual. The examples I've been giving you are visual, right? So if we talk about baseball, about a pitcher, you know we have a physical environment that a ball that has a size, a mass, a late, a lace height, um, and so on. And we, we, you know, if we're using weighted balls in training, right? Um, this is going to, the ball that we give the pitcher is going to structure, in this case, the proprioceptive information they get, right? So we hit our tendons and our muscles as we hold the ball are going to have particular lengths and forces that depend on the physical properties of the ball. So we can pick up the affordances of the ball based on how it structures the proprioceptive information we're receiving, right? So, and this is, we'll come back to this later on when we talk about why, better ways to do weighted ball training. This will be important, okay? So we have this affordance, these affordances, and if we think about it, in, any time as we're acting in an environment, there's going to be a field of affordances. That is, there's going to be multiple invitations coming to us at once, right? So uh, the chairs behind me at the conference, I could have sat on them, I could lie down, uh, there's a fire. There's a fire alarm on the wall. I could climb on the chairs to pull the fire alarm. I could rearrange the furniture if I felt like feng shuiing the room. Right? There's tons of uh, invitations. Right? In, in baseball, I get the same. I could I could uh, jam a batter. I could throw it outside. I could move them off the plate. I could hit them. You know. There's, so there's lots of different affordances offered. Okay. And there's lots of great illustrations of this we can see around. You know, if you look at a playground how it's designed, all the, it offers tons of different affordances for kids, running, sliding, hiding, climbing, you know, parts of it offer affordances for people in a wheelchair that other parts don't, right? So any time in our environment, we're getting this field of affordances, right? These invitations to act, right? Invitations, depending on our goal and attention, we're going to take one of these, okay? So, so that's one. So affordances are opportunities of action that are conveyed by their environment, our environment, okay, by information, the structuring of sensory information. But there's an important part here, okay? The affordances we perceive depend on information, but they also depend on, depend on what actions we're capable of producing, right? Our e e effect, what are called, Gibson called effectivities. So the information coming in is scaled by both our body dimensions and our action capacities, right? So if, for example, uh, a basket, 10 foot regulation basketball hoop does not send me the invitation to dunk, right? I do not have the action capacity or body dimensions to be able to dunk a basketball. So I'm not getting that letter in the mail, right? I'm not getting that invitation. Um, even though uh, for another person, that that does the same information structuring of light off the rim does invite that invitation. Okay. So body dimensions, you know, we're talking about the length of your arms. If I, if I'm a batter and I have long arms and you throw me an outside pitch, I can foul it off. I could, I could swing so as to foul it off. I could just let it go and take it, or I could try to take that pitch and drive it to the off opposite field. Okay. Um, the if I have shorter arms, right, then all I can really do is take it and foul it off. I, if I can't reach out and cover that outside of the part of the plate, I don't have the invitation to drive and get a hit to the opposite field is no longer there, right? So, um, you know, if I have good extension flexibility, we know. So the key point I want to make here is that less effectivities, right, less action capacity as a performer result in fewer invitations from the environment. Right, that's my basketball. I'm, I have less action capacity. My body dimensions are different, so I'm getting one less invitation than someone that's six five on a basketball court. Right, so at low, fewer expectation effectivities equals fewer invitations. Okay, so so 
what this creates, right? So we get this uh, when we have this kind of combination of information and in our and our uh, capabilities, we get what's called uh, we define clear action boundaries, right? As a performer, we learn where uh, the affordances stop and start, right? So <clears throat> there's some classic work on this by, for example, by Bill Warren and colleagues. You know, having people walk through an, an aperture, a doorway. Um, as you decrease the the width of the doorway, people will turn sideways to go through it, right? <clears throat> the point at which people turn depends perfectly on their shoulder width, right? People with wider shoulders turn a bit earlier People for wider doors. People with narrow shoulders turn for smaller doors. But if you actually scale the information, the width of the door, by your shoulder, your body dimension, your shoulder width, you get the same effect for everybody. Also, you know, you get action boundaries for as a hitter, right? If you're standing off the plate, there are going to be certain pitch locations you can reach. Um, you could drive the opposite way. You could hit. And then as it gets further out, we're going to hit an action boundary where that affordance is no longer offered. You can no longer hit the ball the opposite way. It's too, too far away from your body. And part of being a skilled athlete is being well calibrated to these action boundaries, right? Knowing, you know, and sometimes we use this phrase, playing within yourself, Right knowing where your boundaries are. We'll talk a little bit about how we can achieve that, okay? So this is all to say, right? So if we understand this idea of affordances, information, effectivities, there's an opportunity here. You can see this opportunity. If, de if lower effectivities, lower action capacities gives you less invitations from your environment, less affordances, then by increasing your action capacity, we could potentially Make it so you get more inv invitations or extend your action boundaries, okay? So by changing our body composition or increasing our action capacity, we could potentially increase the number of invitations we receive from the environment. This, in turn, is going to give us more available movement solutions. In my basketball example, give it me being able to dunk is now an opportunity that I could take, right? It gives me more options to get do score a basket in, in different situations, right? It's going to be more make me more adaptable to changing constraints, right? If I get more options, more invitations, I'm more adaptable. But there's a key point here, okay? So we'll, let's go through some details of of this kind of this makes a lot of sense to in, in people and the basic idea, you know, if I if I do. If I lift weights in the gym and it makes me stronger, it's going to make me a better athlete on the court. That's a fundamental idea we've had for a long time. Here I want to get into why and how we need to, to, to do that, right? We can't just do it any old way. So I'm going to go through some warnings. First of all, increasing the number of invitations does not guarantee they'll be accepted, okay? We can't just have a person in the gym and increase their leg strength and increase their force um, increase the batter's ability to extend, increase my, my ability to jump, my jump height. We need to combine this capacity training, right? Training to develop these capacities with appropriate practice designs that are going to amplify the new affordances, right? So if I give the new affordance of hitting the ball on the outside part of the plate or dunking, right? I need to, that is a new invitation, Right. But a batter, the athlete might not take it, right? So if we want them to take it, we need to combine that with practice design that kind of amplifies this new opportunity, you know, shows it to them and makes it apparent, okay? So, you know, example, going back to my exam, um, um, you know, uh, the design example, right? If you're training your athlete to get better at pushing, right, don't put them in a room full of pull doors, Right. We don't put them in a practice environment that conflicts with what we're trying to achieve, right? And we do this a lot of ways in sports, right? If we, we do this, for example, we, um, we want to encourage our athletes to explore and try different things, that, but at the same time, we do not make it a friendly environment for making mistakes, right? They're being scouted or videotaped or, you know, right? So we make, need to make sure if we're going to get this relationship we want, increasing action capacity makes our athlete more skillful. We need to make sure the practice design offers these new affordances, supports them, and at the very least does not conflict with them, okay? Warning number two, action capacities are highly task-specific, right? 
So not everything we are we uh, can improve in a weight room or a training using a training technology is going to offer a new invitation in our skill, right? There's no general abilities, right? We can't uh, we can't uh, act. Eye hand coordination is not an action capacity. Neither is attention. Neither is visual tra tracking. Neither is decision making, right? Those are not general abilities. Those are skills, right? They're not action capacities, right? So I've talked about this tons of times before. For training devices like DynaVision and NeuroTracker, which are they're they're not. Those are not capacities. You cannot develop the capacity of uh, attentional focus and then have more invitations, right? There's no research at all to support that, right? There's no research at all to support that generalized training makes you more skillful in specific situations, right? Um, here are some examples, you know, you, if you, you know, there's been articles, um, there's no evidence for far transfer of cognitive training to sports performance. Do brain training programs work? Spoiler, no, if you read the article. Testing the effects of 3D multiple object tracking training on near, mid, and far transfer. Spoiler, you only get near transfer. When you practice on NeuroTracker, you only get better at NeuroTracker. And then perhaps the strongest evidence is that um, some of these companies get sued. They get uh, charged from the FTC for false claims, right? There is no evidence at all to support the idea that playing some silly memory game on Lumosity app is going to help you find your car better in a parking lot, right? That's not a capacity, right? It's not a, so it's not going to offer more invitations. Those those are not action capacities. The ha action capacities are not general things like that. Okay, three. Um, this is one of my biggest points I want to make. Right? Stop treating skills like they're action capacities. Right? A swing is not a capacity. Agility is not a capacity. Right? Those are skills. Okay. Um, let me show you, let me try to explain why, okay? A skill, as I would define it, is the ability to use information from our environment to find and execute a movement solution <clears throat> to realize our affordance that will achieve our goal or intention, okay? So the key components, skills are information-driven and coupled. They're goal-driven, purposeful, and functional, right? And they involve decision-making. They involve picking an affordance to realize, right? Picking an affordance to take, selecting an invitation that you got, right? That's my definition of a skill, right? So in skill, <clears throat> skills involve an intention. You know, am I going to hit a home run to take the lead in the game? Or I'm going to try to drive the runner in from second base? Or I'm going to try to draw a walk to get the next hero alive? Or am I just going to foul off the pitch to get yet another one? right? There's multiple invitations. <clears throat> and part of the, the, what means to be skillful is being able to pick out the appropriate invitation, right? So we, we you know, we can't, we, this is critical to training a skill, having these intentions, okay? Once we, skills are coupled and information driven, once we decide on the attention we want to realize, okay, once we, we educate our attention, um, we're we're going to information is going to convey the affordance for that intention, uh, opportunity for action that's related to our intention, right? So maybe a pitch is on the outside part of the plate that is not consistent with an intention of trying to pull the ball in baseball, right? So information conveys affordances. We link it with our intentions. <clears throat> information is also used to control our movements, right? So the information about the ball's time. Um, <clears throat> angle of approach and it's time to collision uh, offers the affordance in the first first place, but it's also what are we use to actually move the bat in our body as we swing. <clears throat> so skills are information. Okay, why is hitting off a tee, for example, not a skill? <clears throat> hitting off a tee is not a skill because it's not information driven, right? You don't need to pick up any information. There's no affordances, right? There's no field of affordances. They're only hitting hitting it. Hitting the ball, right? There's no taking it the other way, not swinging, right? There's no variation in our tension. There's no decision making, right? So it's not a skill. Hitting is not a skill. Hitting off a tee is not a skill. Um, same with, um, you know, doing agility drills around cones. It's not information driven. There's no intentions, right? There's no goals. There's no afford no field of affordances. There's no decision making, right? You're, you're just... 
you're so clearly running around cones and um, uh, hitting off tees are not skills, right? As I'm going to define them. So what is the alternative? Well, you know, what's the other thing? So that, if that's a skill, what's an action capacity? Okay. So my definition of action capacity is a physical or psychological ability that influences the field of affordances for a given task. Okay. It changes the number of invitations and moves the action uh, action boundaries, right? So action capacities, first, are highly specific to the skill we're talking about. There's no general action capacities in my view. So identifying, uh, so what we need to do first is identifying the relevant action capacities by trying to do a task analysis, understanding what's involved in our skill is what we, we need, okay? So that's what I mean by an action capacity. This ability that when we go, an action capacity is a, an ability or a psychological or a physical ability that when we go to performing our skill is going to influence the number of affordances, right? My height is going to influence when I play basketball, right? It influences the field of affordance. My height does not influence the field of affordances when I play chess, right? It's irrelevant, okay? It's a relevant action capacity. So they're, they're highly specific, okay? When, when, we, when we're training and assessing and developing action capacities, we largely do this in an uncoupled manner, right? So we're not, they're not driven by information in the same way as the skill, okay? They don't involve really any decision um, making, okay? And they don't involve really any intention or goal other than to produce the movement himself, right? So if you can think of something you do in a weight room, like a squat, Yes, there's information, right? Obviously, we're picking up information from our body, proprioceptive, but it's not really information from the environment that, you know, not information related to achieving in a goal. There's no decision making. We don't get to decide whether to do a one foot squat or two foot squat, right? And there's no real intention. We're not trying to carry the weight somewhere or put it up somewhere. All we're doing is trying to produce the movement itself, right? For me, that's how we train action capacities. Um, here's an example um, um, of, example of uh, I, I love from the um, episode, the sports science episode. Um, the um, let me just go back to here. Um, uh, there's a great series, ESPN Sports Science, and it's showing. Uh, it talks about uh, a lot about uh, capacity and speed. So let, capacity and skill, right here. Let me show you this. In his eyes. <laughs> Our heavy bag, used by the USA boxing team, is outfitted with special pressure sensors that will allow us, for the first time ever, to measure the power of Rampage's punch. How will the mass of Rampage's flying fist stack up to the classic art of sumo? You ready? Oh! The impact is staggering. Nate, what were we seeing on that? Can you, can you feel him staring at you? I can. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that uh, there's, there's definitely, definitely uh, some data there. Our cutting edge motion capture technology from Vicon House of Moves takes us inside this punishing punch. There's a reason why Rampage Jackson wins over half his fights by knockout. A punch isn't about mass. The fist weighs little more than the brain itself, but he generates massive velocity. Enough to deliver 1,800 pounds of force and cause his opponent's brain to recoil back and forth in the skull. Kind of like having a teenage hippo sit on your head. Okay, um, so if you've never seen that full video, I, I'd recommend you go watch it. It's fun. They actually compare uh, Rampage Jackson's MMA, M an MMA fighter, the force of his punch with the force generated by a sumo wrestler. And they're trying to answer the question is, is it better to be big and slow or small and fast, which generates more force? But the idea there, what I want to show, the ability to generate force, right, is an action capacity, right? It's ability to, to generate force, um, 
that can be developed, you know, by hitting a heavy bag, doing weight lift, you know, right? So that's an action capacity. When he goes in the match, that it creates the affordance of knocking someone out with one punch, right? If you have more action capacity in terms of force. Okay? So in baseball, an example of um, a capacity we could talk about is angular velocity, right? So the maximum angular velocity I can have, the maximum rate of change of back position I can produce, right, um, is an action capacity, right? Um, it doesn't necessarily on its own make me a good hitter. And it's not, sometimes we call this bat speed. Now, how quickly can I move my bat from point A to point B, right? That's a capacity. Um, it's not really what we mean by the term bat speed. Sometimes it is, but when we're talking about bat speed, the key point is this action capacity, right? Any action, relevant action capacity is one of multiple that goes into this producing this skill, right? So any given skill is a multifactorial thing that has multiple action capacities that go into it. So for hitting, for example, in order to have good bat speed, right? To be able to hit fast pitches, to be able to get your bat to the ball quickly, it's way more than how quickly you can actually rotate, right? That's part of it, obviously, but it also depends on your gaze, your decision-making, how quickly you pick up information, your, the kinetic chain, you can how well you can adjust your bat position to get it to the ball, how well you can decelerate. If you're not decelerating properly, you're not likely to be able to accelerate it quickly, is, right? So all of these capacities go into the skill, right? And angular rotation is just one of them, okay? So increasing the capacity of maximal angular velocity, increasing you, my ability to move a bat from point A to point B has the potential to increase the skill of baseball batting, right? So getting my angular velocity is a, a capacity, right? It's not driven by any information. I'm not caring, not trying to move to interact with an object in the environment like a ball, okay? I'm not, um, it's not, there's no decision involved. I'm just moving my bat as quickly as possible. And there's no real in intention. There's no other affordance that I'm trying to realize other than moving my bat quickly, right? So if I swung my bat to, with one, uh, you know, blast tracker and see how fast it moved, right? That's a capacity measurement. And I could do some training to increase that. If that has the potential to improve the skill, baseball batting is a skill, you have to couple your movement to information. You have to make decisions. You have to have intentions, so on and so forth. It can improve the skill by increasing the number of affordances. Okay. So um, if I have, if I can move the bat quicker from point A to point B, that invites the opportunity to generate a higher exit velocity so I could hit home runs. It also invites the opportunity to wait a bit longer to start the bat movement. If I if it takes me less time to get the bat from point A to point B, it does that alone doesn't necessarily make me a better hitter. What it does do though is gives me an invitation, right? It gives me the invitation to wait a little bit longer, gather a bit more information from the pitcher before I start the movement of my bat. Okay. But again, that's only going to help if I accept and execute that invitation. I could work all day in the months and months in the gym to make you be able to move your bat faster from, from your shoulder to a ball on the tee, right? Um, and we generate more uh, force and more velocity. But if you're not using that to take some invitation in the skill, like waiting longer to start the swing, then it's useless, okay? So that's the key point. We need to link them, okay? And I've done a little bit of this work in some of the research I've done. So back in 2008, my graduate student, Sandy Scott, and I did a study where we looked at the relationship between action capacities and affordances in batters by what we did in the study was we increased their bat rate. So we had them swinging for a while. They were hitting with really low errors. The timing was great. They're driving the ball all over the place. We suddenly gave them a heavier bat. We added weight to the bat. And what happened was they their timing went off, right? They were missing the pitches. But then it quickly, after a few trials, they got a few swings, they got it back. Right? They adjusted to this new bat weight. But what we were most interested in the study was how they adjusted and how they, they um, so we created, we've created these new constraints to them, right? This new environment. How do they adjust? How do they change their movement solution? And what we found was there's two different ways people did it. Some batters just swung harder, 
right? So basically, they um, generated more force. They they we measured force in the muscles and things, and they measured they generated more force so that essentially they got the bat back to the same speed it was before moving. So they got the velocity of the bat movement back to the same speed it was with the lighter bat. So they just adjusted their bat speed. Okay. The other group of batters didn't do that. They adjusted their swing time, right? So they started their swing a little bit earlier when they had the heavier bat. Digging deeper, what we found was, so one group took the affordance of swinging harder. One took this one of swinging earlier, essentially. Um, what, what we found, okay, so we get this functional difference. What we found is this depended on their action capacities. So what we did for all of these batters is we met, we took a ball on a tee, right? See, sometimes I use them. <laughs> the ball on the tee and we had them swing for different bat weights and see how much speed they could generate, right? And this is a method developed by Terry Bayhill. Basically, you keep giving them the bat weight and you find at what point does your, your bat speed start to plateau, right? So there's a point where adding adding more weight actually helps sp uh, speed, right? Because it generates more momentum, more angular momentum. Uh, the, the you know the, the so, but at some point it's going to fall off. So we find that optimal point where a bat weight, where you kind of the heavy enough to generate momentum, but not heavy enough to to slow you down. And we, and you can we that creates what we call a recommended bat weight. And what you found was that people that have a high recommended bat weight, right, that can generate the same speed with a good speed with a higher bat weight are the ones that just swung harder in my study. The ones that had a lower recommended bat weight, a different action capacity, adjusted timing, right? So you can see the action capacities are influencing the affordances, the adjustments the batterers are making, right? Um, and in this case, right, the problem is, right, Having to swing earlier is not the best strategy, right? It's not the best thing to be doing. You're going to get less time to view the ball. You're going to be more susceptible to things like tunneling. Um, you, you know, you're going to have, you're going to be a less effective hitter. So you can see having less action capacities, being able to generate less rotational velocity of the bat, right, is actually hurting your skill, right? Because it's giving you uh, the four, it's not allowing you to giving you the invitation of just swinging harder, right? To, to in my experiment. Okay. All right. So there's some of the basics and the difference between the action capacities skill. What are some of the training uh, implications? Okay. So training to increase action capacity, the first thing we want to note is that it should be guided by principles of effective force speed Etc. generation, not some ideal technique. You know, this is what Randy Sullivan calls conditions, not positions, right? In order to move my bat from here to there as quickly as possible, I don't have to have a particular elbow angle or a particular shoulder, you know, rotation. But there are some things I need to satisfy. There are some principles uh, like the kinet kinetic chaining, linking, that I need to satisfy in order to do that, right? And that answers that first burning question I posed at the start. Training to develop uh, tractors like a hip hinge, like stepping from above, uh, you know, are those are principles of effective movements across a bunch of different skills. They're not positions of an ideal technique, right? They're principles of effective movement. So uh, developing attractors is not the same as prescribing an ideal technique. For example, saying you have to, brace on your front leg or lock your lead leg locking and pitching. Those are prescriptions, right? Those are prescriptions, um, you know, about keeping your, you know, doing rotating your palms in certain ways when you hit, right? Those are prescriptions of the, the, the purpose of those is to get the batter to swing in a particular way. Attractors are to develop the, the basic patterns we need for effective force generation, for example. Okay. Yeah, the second point, you know, related to this, we're not trying to build an ideal swing, okay? We're not constructing a skyscraper. That's a what we call a hard assembly. We build something, it's done, it's stuck, right? That's really what the philosophy of a, a hitting off a tee, right? Hitting off a tee, we're trying to build the structure of a swing that is going to stay the same and constant, okay? That's, that's the wrong way to think about things, right? 
What we're trying to do instead is f building soft assemblies. So think about tents, not skyscrapers, okay? So a baseball swing is not a skyscraper, it's a tent because you keep needing to move it around based on the conditions, right? Next campsite you go to, there's a tree root where you wanted to put the pole or the peg, right? So you got to do something different. You, you, you know, you got you to put it lower, right? So that's the way that we move, right? We move by doing what's called a soft assembly. We build a slightly different swing on every swing, right? Based on the constraints, right? We deal different elbow angles, different shoulder angles, different positions. We have this functional variability, right? So training to develop action capacity is not about erecting a skyscraper. It's about giving more potentials for soft assembly, right? That's so it's giving us more tent poles, more pegs, right? It's not building a skyscraper, okay? Training implication number two, training to increase action capacity should involve variability, overload, and perturbations that provide a stimulus for change and challenge stability, okay? Um, action capacities need to be functionally adaptable. They need to be able to adapt to the constraints, right? We need to challenge you. We need to push you, right? And this gets to a point, you know, okay, if I tell you that hitting off a tee is not good because it's not a skill, right? You can't hard assemble a swing and build a swing that you can just execute. The idea behind that, right, is that, you know, we could build a swing that you just pull out later. That's the motor program idea, right? So if we can't do that, wouldn't hitting off a tee develop ac action capacity? Um, you know, wouldn't it help you generate faster angular rotation, getting your bat from here to there if I kept having you to hit off a tee? Yeah, sure. By about the same amount as drinking a beer will develop my lifting capacity, right? Yes, it does, but it's not designed for that purpose, right? It's not. There's way better ways we can develop the, the capacity of angular velocity or lifting or force generation than doing hitting off a tee, right? So it's not good at developing action capacity either, right? What we want to do, for example, when using something like an active vault, we want to load, uh, we want to have load and variability to, we need to get you to change your action capacity. You don't just do it for fun, right? We need a perturbate to challenge stability. Your new action capacity needs to be able to be stable, right? We don't want it to, um, you know, disappear in the, in, depending on the constraint. We want it um, connected, right? It needs to be linked in time, uh, different attractors, right? We, in doing this, in most cases, when we're developing an action capacity, not always, but in a lot of cases, it's going to be uncoupled and isolated because we're not working on the skill, right? When we have you move a, a aqua ball through the movement like a swing, we're not getting you to time the swing. We're not caring about your ability to make decisions or intentions. All we're doing here is we're help, <coughs> helping you develop stable attractors that will give you the better capacity to get your bat from here to there and quicker. You're going to have to plug that into the skill later, right? We're just developing this capacity. Okay. Training implication number three. When you're increasing action capacities, we need to combine this with practice design, right? As I said before, increasing action capacities gives you more invitations. If we don't design the, the, the associated skill practice so that people take these invitations, we're just wasting time, okay? And the best way to do this in my mind is a constraints-led approach, designing a practice that will, you know, um, invite, the, um, an, invite an affordance that's consistent with this increased action capacity, right? Let me give you a couple examples. So we're gonna use a constraints-led approach. What we're gonna do is try to destabilize what you're doing now and, get you to explore new movement solutions, get you to look at these new invitations. And hopefully we can design it so that the new invitation associated with the action capacity we were working on is big and bright. It's in a pink envelope, right? So you see it, right? And you open it first, right? That's what we want to try to achieve with our practice design. For example, a good example of this, you know, so if we spend a lot of time in the gym working with aqua balls and working with different things to increase our angular rotation, our ability to get the bat from here to there with effective force, that's an action capacity. This invites the, op the affordance of waiting longer, right, before we start our bat movement because we can move the bat quicker. 
We, but we, if we want the athlete to take that invitation, one thing we could do, for example, is add a task constraint in practice using visual occlusion, right? If we visual occlude, for example, we, um, you know, we, um, we, we, we wait, for example, we start with the glasses closed or your eyes closed and tell you to open them while the ball's in flight. We're encouraging you to use information later in the ball flight, right? So we're creating this new invitation. Wait and pick up information later in the ball flight before you start bat movement. That is, that is nicely aligned with what we're trying to develop in our action capacity. By using this task constraint of occlusion, we've amplified the affordance of using information later in the ball flight, right? We've had these two, in, two working together. And I think that's critical for, for doing, doing this importantly, okay? Training implication number four, training to increase action capacities to focus on the development of adapt adaptability, organi self-organization, and functional variability, not progressive linear increases, okay? So for this, I want to talk about some of the methods that have been used um, commonly in baseball, particularly for pitchers, right? So the idea of developing an action capacity is, you know, is not new, right? Um, it fits with the eye things like weighted ball training, doing long toss, like right? throwing from a distance longer than the actual pitching distance. The idea there is, you know, I'm developing the action capacity of you, your ability to throw harder, right? So that when your pitcher, you get in the game, the affordance of blowing a fastball by someone is now invited, right? Because you can throw harder because um, you've strengthened. What, so I, th that idea has been around for a long time. The problem with that, <coughs> the problem is with the way we've been doing it. Like what we focused on is making progressive linear increases. So what I'm trying to do is progressively and linearly increase this capacity of arm strength, of rotation ability, rather than focusing on adaptability and functional variability. Okay, so let me give you a, a specific examples. Okay, so weighted ball training, right? So weighted ball training, there's a bunch of studies out there. Most of them show that when you train with weighted balls, you get an increase in um, uh, pitch velocity, right? They work. But there's some kind of controversial studies, particularly this one by Reinhold in 2018, where they did weighted ball training. They found the uh, increase in uh, pitch, uh, pitch velocity, but they also crowd, had tons of injuries <laughs> in the weighted ball group. They had a bunch of uh, a UCL, torn elbow ligaments, a bunch of things going on. I think they had six or seven athletes get injured. In what they found, <coughs> first of all, what they found was related to some week. What happens in weight, weighted ball training? The reason you throw harder in, after weighted ball training is you progressively increase your external rotation of the shoulder. You, 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 it allows you to rotate your shoulder over a greater range, right? So in this picture, the before training, it was 110 degrees. After training, it's 135 degrees. Being able to rotate over a greater range gives you more time to apply force to get throw harder, right? So we're causing a simple linear adaptation, right? This simple increase in shoulder for rotation. Why? Because in almost all weighted ball studies, we progressively increase the ball weight. We either go add more, right? Uh, they were also doing the intensity, right? Um, so you, you do these progressive increases because we want progressive and change. The idea is we want the slowly you to open up your shoulder more. That's why people are getting hurt. That's when people get hurt, right? You're forcing this one linear adapt change rather than adaptation, right? So it's overly constrained stimuli <coughs> lead to overly constri constrained capacity adaptations. This just extension of shoulder rotation that are potentially dangerous. Um, another example is long toss, right? And here's a quote from a paper by Fleissig et al. Long toss, hard horizontal flat ground throws have biomechanical patterns similar to those of pitching and are therefore reasonable exercises. However, maximum distance throws produce increased torques and changes in kinematics. <clears throat> Caution is therefore advised in the use of these throws for rehabilitation and training, right? So for those who don't, don't know, in long distance and long toss, what you do with a pitcher is you progressively increase the distance they're throwing from, right? Um, 
from the mound distance to longer. Oftentimes you get them to try to break the record for the longest throw. Again, progressive linear changes, right? Yes, that that is likely to that's over constrained. It's going to lead to simple uh, simple changes in the action capacity. Okay, so again, this is the wrong way to do it. Okay, what's the better way? Right, the purpose of changing the throwing distance and ball weight should not be to produce the same movement patterns you get in the typical delivery. In fact, we want different ones. Right, we want you to explore new movement patterns. So the purpose of using weighted balls and long toss should be encourage the athlete to explore different movement solutions and learn about the solution space. So in long toss, learning how what I need to do to get the ball to get to the plate from 100 feet away is useful information. It's getting me to explore this movement space, right? How I can change my delivery to get the ball to travel further, okay? We're giving the athlete new problems to solve Okay, different than the ones they're going to face in a competition, right? Um, but they're going to what they're going to do is give the athlete more capacity to solve the ones they actually face. So in com in a real baseball game, you're not going to have to throw pitch from 100 feet, but you do need to adapt to fatigue, different ball, wind, etc., weather. Okay, so what we're trying to do is we're not trying. We shouldn't be focusing on making these linear constrained adaptations and ac action capacity. We want to randomly vary the ball weight, right? We want, we don't want to get introduce these progressive increases. We want to give the athletes the opportunity to perceive the affordances. Let the athlete hold the new ball for a while and feel it, right? That's going to give them the, the information from their tendons we were talking about earlier. Okay. And that's going to allow them to, to get in feel, right? We want to, we, in when we're doing extreme conditions like really heavy balls, we probably want to constrain the degrees of freedom. So, doing a kneeling throw, for example, so there's less movements involved, right? So, again, encourage adaptation and exploration to increase action capacity, not these simple progressive changes like increased range of motion in your shoulder. Okay. Training implication number five, right? Um, also, right, we, we've all we've been focusing on these isolated drills. Obviously, action capacity can be developed within the the skill itself, right? Um, also, through with appropriate use of constraints, we can develop action capacities. Classic example, you know, swinging with a weighted bat, hitting a ball with a weighted bat is skill, right? We're information movement coupling. Um, you know, we're getting you know. We're making decisions, we have intentions, but we're increasing your action capacity, right? Um, example, for example, uh, you know, we can also increase the action capacity through development of attractors, right? So we can have you hit while you're stepping over a hurdle, right? So we're performing our skill, but we're adding a constraint to develop the capacity of hip hinge, right? The attractor, hip hinge attractor. Here, we're adding a pool noodle that you have to hit on your follow through. We're, we're while we're doing the skill, hitting the ball, we're developing the capacity of have, having effective deceleration of the movement, which is a principle that we need for effective force generation. Okay, so we can within the skill training itself, we can also develop action capacities as well if we do it in the in the right way with the right constraints. Okay, so what are the key takeaways from from this presentation? Well, number one. Don't treat skills like their capacities. You can't build a swing. You can't build agility and store it so it can be pulled out later, right? That's not what it is. Being skillful does not involve a process. One of my favorite quotes of all time, being skillful does not involve a process of repeating the solution. It involves repeating the process of finding a solution, okay? So it's not about building a skyscraper that you can just pull out all the time. It's about erecting tents, right? In different campgrounds, right? You're repeating the process of finding a way to get that tent upright so you can sleep in it, right? So we're not trying to store within us a swing or a delivery, right? We're trying to give us a capacity so we can keep finding the swing and finding the delivery that works in this particular situation under these particular straight in this particular campground, if you will. Okay. Number two, having greater action, action capacity involves having variability, stability, connection, and feel. Okay. 
it's it's a complex thing, not just about simple changes in physical variables like range of motion and force output. So we need to be training and developing different things than these simple measurements. Okay. Number three, sending an athlete more invitations is a waste of time if they're never going to open them, right? Um, if they're going to crumple them up and throw them away. You have to connect the action capacity training, what you're doing in the, the gym, what you're doing with isolated training with practice design that amplifies the invitations that you're working on, okay? Don't, and at the very least, doesn't conflict with it, right? Um, don't <laughs> develop a, a field of pull handles when you're developing the action capacity to push, right? We need to design a practice so that the affordances are there naturally, right? And there's lots of great ways to do this. And the last point that I want to make today, right? I talked most, mostly what I've talked about is positive affordances. So opportunities to achieve something we want to achieve. Gibson very correctly pointed out that there's also negative affordances. Things in our environment that send invitations for danger or injury that we want to avoid, okay? And those come in the form of things like pain, uh, re-injury, Right. And once you, if you get, you know, you have elbow surgery, potential for re injury is a negative affordance. Okay. So when we have these come out, right, we need, they add to the affordance landscape. So the affordance landscape is not just all these great things being invitations, it's also negative things. Right. So we need to give athletes the opportunity to explore this new affordance landscape when we have pain or uh, we were recovering from an injury, or we've changed our body, we're less flexible because we injured our knee. We can't force them back into new solutions. We need to get them to explore this new field of affordances and learn how to move with their new body. Whenever you get injured, you have a new body, right? And you have to learn to, to move it effectively again. Well, the, that's the bad news. The good news is we do this all the time. Right. It's just uh, you got a new campground, right? You got to put up a tent in a new campground. There's nothing new. Right. OK. So that's that's it for what I wanted to talk about. Um, thanks for joining me. Uh, cheers for now and keep them coupled. OK, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at Rob Gray at ASU.edu or follow me on Twitter at Shaky Weights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out PerceptionAction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perception action. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. <laughs>